Welcome to Damaging Ignorance. If we knew now what the Italians knew when they had only 31 cases of coronavirus like us, what would we do differently? At 31 cases, the Italians were still putting and eating life with a big spoon. And because they treated caution with contempt, the gods were not kind to them. On Friday alone, 1,000 Italians died from the virus, and the calamity visited upon them is not over yet. What about the Spaniards, people from Spain? What did they know when they had only 31 cases like Kenya? What would they do differently if they were where we are today as Kenyans? What did they ignore and why do they regret it? And how did they become the second largest cash faulty of the virus after the US? Like Kenyans, the people of Spain or Spaniards are anti-authority. In the name of democracy and an animal called human rights, they ignored government directives. They abused their leaders, criticized them, and intimidated the police. Now their bodies are being carried in military trucks for mass burials in unmarked graves. What about patient 31 in South Korea, the woman who infected thousands of worshippers in a church service, then proceeded to a buffet lunch infecting children and the elderly? If she knew that she had the virus, after flying from Wuhan to South Korea, what would she have done differently? These are the questions that have bothered me. And bothered by these questions, I asked my young researchers to show me the future. I asked them to use science to show me tomorrow. Using what we call exponential models, I asked them to study Italy, Spain, and Iran, and to study them from when they had only 31 cases like in Kenya, and to show me how the 31 cases led to 1,000 deaths a day in Italy. And using the experiences of the three countries, I wanted them to show me where Kenya will be by April and May, if we behave like Italy and Spain. But I also reminded them that Kenya is not Italy or Spain. Our medical infrastructure is weak. The results of the model came back with a 95% confidence level. And I could be completely wrong on this, but I challenge other think tanks and behavior scientists like myself to come up with similar models for public conversations. Now, our predictability model shows that if we behave casually like the Spaniards and the Italians, we will have 160,000 infections by the end of April. Yeah, 160,000 infections. If you have to follow the curve as we see it in Italy and Spain. And that is actually 40,000 infections every single week in the case of Kenya. Now, if when we had 31 cases, one person died. How many will die if we have 160,000 cases? Hypothetically. Taking all things constant, we will have 5,333 uh, Kenyans dying by the end of April. And if you had to use the Italian figures, the story also changes hypothetically. They have about 80,000 infections. And of this, 8,000 have died, representing 10% of the infected. If Italy has better facilities than Kenya, and 10% of the infected have died, what does this mean for us with our weak infrastructure? And the answer is simple. If you have 160,000 infections by end of April, at least 10% or 16,000 will die. And I could also be completely wrong on this. But even then, this number assumes that our facilities are like those of Italy, which they are not. What is my point here? Numbers don't lie. If you torture them hard enough, 
they will tell you the truth. And the truth is simple, that things are bad. And you need to take this seriously. If the US and Britain are overwhelmed by this virus, who are we? If the Prince of Wales, the Prince of Monaco, the wife of the Canadian Prime Minister, the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, if all these people have the virus, what chance does a lumpen proletariat from Korosho or Kibera have? I have two appeals to make. Number one, if we stand behind Uru Kenyatta without turning to the right or to the left, we will overcome. We must not behave like Spain, which challenge authority at every particular moment. Now, if Uhuru orders a curfew, we must support it. If he orders a total lockdown, which I actually think he should next week, we must support it as well. And when things are difficult, let us innovate. Because Kenyans are very good at brilliant innovations. And we must lead the world in how we manage our slum populations through innovations. For instance, the slum populations can be moved to churches because this is one of our biggest challenges. And I'm saying they can be moved to churches because after all, churches are closed. And they're huge sanctuaries and nothing but dead capital until this virus is gone. Why not then move the slum populations there and isolate them, take care of them uh, from um, these particular sanctuaries? After all, that's what a sanctuary, a place where Elohim himself dwells, is supposed to be. Innovations, we will need to innovate so that when people are giving us ideas about how things or criticizing uh, how we shall deal with the situation, let them criticize but also give us innovations and Kenyans are very good at doing it. The corporate sector can take leadership in this uh, process. Number two, I appeal to the government to show no mercy because this virus will show us none. This is a moment for what we call governmentation. A moment when everything necessary to preserve the majority of the people is done. A moment when the end must justify the means. A moment when we must preserve our young men in particular because this virus has targeted the male gender. We must protect our young men and we cannot protect our young men by being nice. You must do it by any means necessary. And those who disagree with me on this are welcome to do so from their locations of isolation. God bless Kenya. <laughs>